Hey guys! So I've been doing a lot of research on old mainframe computers of the 50s and 60s. It's kind of cool that they didn't know that transistors and integrated circuits were going to win out and be the, uh, the way that computers are manufactured. You know, transistors were a new thing and integrated circuits didn't come until much later. Um, so a lot of research went into all these alternative methods to do logic gates. Uh, one of them that I think is the most interesting is all magnetic logic. Um, there was actually a computer that shipped that used transformers for doing all of its logic functions, its ANDs and XORs and its ALUs. Um, they could do some very complicated things by winding transformers. They could even do like half adders just by winding the, these uh, little multi-aperture transformers the correct way. Um, it was very difficult to find information about this. Uh, it's, there's lots of information about core memory stacks like this guy here. Uh, this came out of a CDC mainframe from uh, 1970. Uh, this is where the main program was stored and executed from. It's thousands of little cores that are woven in an XY grid, each one of these planes, and uh, there's a sense wire and, and that's how they would store their bits. It wasn't until I found this book, Square Loop Ferrite Circuitry by C.J. Quarterly from 1961 or 62 that I got enough information that I could recreate some of this stuff for you guys. So this is going to be really complicated. I'm going to try to uh, keep it as clear as possible. If uh, you don't understand how transformers work, um, pause me now. I'll wait for you. Uh, go uh, uh, brush up on your transformers and uh, come back. All right, so the two properties that we have to keep in mind through the rest of this video is that ferrites concentrate magnetic flux. So if we have a transformer with a primary and secondary that just has air between them, there's going to be very little coupling between the primary and secondary. But if we put a ferrite or some kind of core material in there, that'll concentrate these magnetic flux lines and induce more current into the secondary. All right, and the second thing to keep in mind is that the magnetic fields need to be contracting and expanding or moving in some way. We could move the coils um, before there's any induction in our secondary. So if we have a DC current on our primary, there will be no induction in the secondary after the magnetic field is stabilized. So most of the things that we'll be doing is pulsing and alternating current. All right. So if we take a look at core materials like ferrite, here's a chart that shows applied magnetic field in this axis and flux in the ferrite in this axis. So the more field that we apply, the more flux is in the ferrite, which is pretty intuitive. There's a point where the ferrite's going to saturate. It can't hold any more flux, so then um, it's, it's going to have less flux and the the magnetic field is going to have to go to the surrounding air and you're going to get less coupling in your transformers. And there's a polarity to it. You can go in the negative polarity on your, your windings and the flux will follow in the same pattern and you'll saturate. All right. To do magnetic logic, you can use this kind of crazy um, ferrite, which is called square ferrite, which has a hysteresis to it. it um, if you look at this chart, it looks like there's a lot of flux in it, but the flux is a magnetization, a remnant magnetization that happens inside the ferrite. So if we were to get a ferrite that had never seen a magnetic field before that has this property, and we apply a field to it, it's going to magnetize in a polarity. All right, and it's going to stay magnetized in that polarity until we apply the opposite magnetic um, polarity to it to a certain point where it falls over this little cliff and then suddenly the core will flip magnetization. It will magnetize in the opposite direction and then if we wound a transformer on that we're going to see some interesting properties on our transformer. We'll see um, sudden changes in the magnetic field which will induce currents in our secondaries. Um, once we're magnetized in the opposite direction we have to push it all the way through, we have to apply a um, opposite polarity to get it to flip magnetization again. So um, it goes 
back and, and forth magnetizing. All right, so my first test rig that I put together is a transformer that's split by an air gap. All right, so it's gonna have that weak coupling. There's gonna be very little coupling between the two transformers because there's air. I have a ferrite that I can push in and we can observe that we can increase the coupling by putting a ferrite in there. And then the next thing I'm gonna show is I'm gonna put a permanent magnet on there and I'm gonna saturate the ferrite so that um, there's very little magnetic field being coupled again. So I have it hooked up to a curve tracer here. This is applying a sine wave to the primary of this transformer right here. You're not gonna see it very well. All right, so this is voltage by current on the display here. And this looks very much like a resistor. And that makes sense because the primary is just a bunch of windings and there's very little inductance in it. So it looks like a resistance. Now, this is showing our secondary on the oscilloscope. We're seeing very little coupling. We don't see our sine wave coming out at all. So I'm gonna take this ferrite and I'm gonna push it into the transformer. So I'm pushing it in now. We can see that the coupling is increasing on our oscilloscope here. And then we're seeing our telltale sign of voltage versus current um, lagging each other, which is a, a sign of an inductor. So. All right, now we have a, a strongly coupled transformer with a ferrite in there. Now I have a permanent magnet. And I'm gonna occupy all those, that space for flux, magnetic flux, with this permanent magnet. And we're gonna observe that now there's very little coupling on our transformer here. And that our curve tracer looks very much like the uh, the, uh, before the ferrite was in there. So that's a property that we're going to take advantage of. Square ferrite, um, since it becomes magnetic, uh, magnetized in one polarity or another, will appear to have low permeability and there'll be less coupling until we hit these thresholds. Alright, so now I'm going to switch over to a square ferrite. Alright, so there's a transformer sitting here which is a square ferrite. And as our sine wave goes up, it looks very much like a, there's no, no core in it at all. It's just a straight line until it hits that hysteresis point where it can overcome the remnant magnetic field and flip it. And then the impedance of the coil changes uh, quite a bit. And then it goes into saturation at the top and looks very much like the um, magnetic core is completely um, saturated. And it, when the uh, sine wave starts to go in the negative direction, now the core is polarized and, and magnetized. We'll go down, we'll see a similar effect until the core flips its magnetization again and then it saturates. And if we look on the oscilloscope, we can see the effect of this. Instead of seeing a nice clean sine wave, we see pulses. So once the sine wave reaches enough amplitude to cause the magnetic um, polar, polar, polarization to flip, then we see a spike. That's a sudden collapse or expansion of the uh, magnetic field. All right, so if we take a look at this, so this is a diagram of what I've, I've put together here. So we have a transformer on a ferrite if we start off with a magnetization and one polarization here, let's say this direction, and we send a pulse into our coil that's going to try to saturate this core in the same direction. All the flux is occupied by the remnant magnetization. So our output is going to be very, very low because there's very little coupling between the input and output. All right, so if we start with a core that's magnetized in this direction, but we have a pulse that's going into our primary that's trying to change the polarity of it, there's gonna be very little on the output until it reaches that threshold point where the magnetization will flip, and then we'll see a very sharp spike on the output. Now this core is now magnetized in the opposite direction. If we were to send that pulse in again, we would see 
no result on the output or a very low result on the output because it would be would be essentially this configuration again where um, the, the pulse would be trying to go in the same direction as the uh, remnant magnetization. All right, to use this as a storage element, all right, we can add a secondary winding to this. So this is our readout winding. So we have our input, which we use for set, setting the magnetization. So we can set the polarity of the, the magnetization. So we can send a pulse in, in say the negative direction. That would set up, uh, assuming that we hit that threshold point, we have to get beyond that hysteresis and get it to magnetize. And then when we hit the readout pulse, which would, let's say, the positive direction, then we would be going against the magnetization. There would be this huge flux shift, and we'd see a pulse going out. Now the core is magnetized in the opposite direction. It's called a destructive readout. If we did another read pulse, we would not see uh, an output because the magnetization is in the, in the, the same direction as the readout. Now this part of the circuitry here, there's a diode in here that's to prevent um, the uh, 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 ringing on the coil from the uh, collapsing magnetic field, and then there's just a single diode here to, um, to only look at the positive going pulses. If this diode wasn't here, we would just see part of the set pulse going through. You can actually, in your system, you can design that out with, uh, you know, winding your coils in the correct way. but. Um, for our purposes, it's easier to just use some diodes in there. All right, so if you want to make non-inverting gates, you can add extra windings to the coils. For instance, to make an AND gate, you would wind the coils in such a way that um, ingoing pulses would only reach 50% of the hysteresis point. So to do an AND function, you'd have to have both of these energized to the point and have enough current flowing through them that you would hit that hysteresis point, and then you would be able to flip the uh, state of this ferrite. For an OR function, um, you know, either input, um, if, if it's pulsed, will set the uh, polarization of the mag remnant magnetization. Um, so you just wind it so that it, it functions in that way. All right, for inverting uh, gates, it gets a little bit more tricky. You can have a biasing uh, coil up here or you can do a preset pulse. The easier one to understand is a preset pulse. So in time, first you preset your gate, so you set the magnetization in, in one direction. And then your input, if it comes along and pulses, it would reset that back to a state that would not give an output. And then your readout pulse would evaluate the gate. If uh, if the preset happens and there's no input, then the polarization would be in such a way that there would be an output pulse. And then when the readout happens, there would be an out output pulse, and that would be your inverted type gate. And then you can have multiple inputs on this type of gate also to do inverting type gates like NAND gates. So this is the test circuit that I put together. Um, hope you guys are following this. This is complicated. I have a gate, and then I have a register stage. And this is very similar to my last video that I made that used, that made dynamic registers. So to understand this a bit more, go take a look at my uh, dynamic shift registers to kind of understand how multi-phase clocks work. All right, so I've got a two input gate, and then I just have a register storage element. I have a clock, that's split into two phases. So first the gate will be evaluated and then second the register will be evaluated. So first something will happen here and then it gets shifted into the register. All right, so this is a pipeline, just a very small pipeline. All right, for my input I have a power supply on one of my inputs to my two input gate. And with that power supply I can change the polarity so I can either allow the function to, I mean the my pulse to propagate or not. And then I have a pulse that goes through and pulses the gate. 
All right, we can see that here. We have, this is the clock, this is the master clock, and it gets split into two phases. So I'm only showing one phase here. This is my pulse that's going into the gate. That's right here, okay? And I'm not showing the other input to the gate. So we can see that this is the output right there of this guy. We can see a little bit of a negative going pulse in here. All right. And then this guy is the output of the register or the storage element. And we can see that nothing is making it all the way through. There's just a small impulse here. So if I turn on my bench power supply, all right, now I'm applying a bias to this input. And we can see as this comes by that I'm enhancing the magnetic field enough that a pulse is making it through the gate. And then on the next clock cycle, it's making it to the register stage. Right. Pulse, pulse out. So the pipeline's working. All right, now if I flip the polarity, I will inhibit the, uh, this pulse from making it into my gate. All right, so I'm inhibiting by reversing the polarity of the input, and nothing's making it through my pipeline. All right, complicated. Um, I'll show it one more time. All right, this, when both this negative going pulse and my, okay, when both of these are negative, that's, that's, um, this one's 50% of the threshold, this one's 50% of the threshold, we get an output. And that pulse is this one, which sets it, and then on the next clock cycle, it passes through. When I flip this to a positive, um, or inverted of uh, what this is, it doesn't reach the threshold, and then nothing passes through our, our, uh, our pipeline. Whew. That was complicated. I hope I explained it well enough. Um, yeah. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.